You're listening to the Whole Church Podcast. Our efforts to educate and unite the church are made possible thanks to our Patreons at patreon.com forward slash the whole church podcast. Please consider joining them by donating $3 a month to help support the show. Ephesians 4, 11 through 13 states, And he gave some as apostles, some as prophets, some as evangelists, some as pastors and teachers for the equipping of the saints, for the work of ministry, for the building up of the body of Christ, until we all attain to the unity of the faith. How can church offices help build the body to attain unity, as it says? Well, it's, um, I think the answer is right in that passage. Um, the, the whole purpose of these gifts is to teach the Word of God. Now, some of them aren't per se teaching gifts or preaching gifts, but they support the preaching and teaching of the Word, like the role of the deacon. It frees up the minister to, to preach the Word of God and do the main task. And as, and as he said in Ephesians, it is to grow up the church in Christ, to mature us in Christ, and then also to make sure that we're not blown around with every false wind of doctrine, every false teaching. And so all of these gifts all try to lead us back to the truth of Christ, the uh, the unity that's found in the Scripture, um, and the unity that's found in Jesus. Unity will never be found in you and I agreeing, just you and I agreeing. Um, real unity is going to be found if we both agree with God, and then we come together around that. That's Christian unity. We can have unity on many subjects, but Christian unity has to be in agreement with what God teaches in His Word. Hey everybody, welcome to the Whole Church Podcast. I am one of your co-hosts, Joshua Knoll, here with your other co-host, the one and only TJ Tiberius Juan Blackwell. Thank you, thank you. Yeah, uh, today is part two of eight in our church offices series. Uh, we are just searching to figure out what these offices are and all these other denominations. And, um, you know, the Bible says somehow these offices help us build unity. So we're going to ask how especially right. when they function so wildly different. Right. We wanted to shout out our patrons, Austin, Russell, Sandra, Lily, Jeannie, Aaron, Justin, Frida, Taryn, and Don. <laughs> and yeah, uh, one thing I, d- I did want to put this caveat out there, just because people are in these clips or part of these interviews doesn't mean that they agree in having complete unity with every other person that is interviewed in this. Um, we have some people that we've interviewed for this that would absolutely not be able to work together. And that is fine. We don't have perfect unity now, but we are building towards it. That being said, we have a series of silly questions we're doing with this series. Um, hope you guys remembered that it was a prerequisite that you watched the movie Barnyard before starting this series. Today's question, pretty simple. It's going to be the same for all of them. If any animal from Barnyard were to fill the office of deacon of the church of the Barnyard, which we've determined is a Lutheran church, which would it be, TJ? So uh, this one took a lot of thinking. Uh, It's hard to define uh, deacon it you know, characteristics, uh, especially from a one and a half hour movie and a 50 episode show. <laughs> uh, but I did decide on Everett, the dog who is the older dog, the 13 year old dog with a Walker. Uh, I feel like he really has the wisdom necessary. That's pretty amusing. I was going to go with Duke, the dog. So we both went with dogs. Uh, my thought process was he was a really good supporting role, you know? And uh, I feel like if one of the main characters were going to care about service, probably be the dog. All right. Yeah. So we'll let That's you guys tell your reasoning. Yeah. But let us know what you think about that. Uh, in the clips coming up, we asked our guests how they would define a deacon. Uh, Later on, we ask them how the office functions in their individual denominations, and then we ask how they can relate to deacons of other traditions. Uh, In this episode, you'll hear clips from Sister Rose, who is a nun at a Catholic church who runs the Catholic campus ministry of UNCW, uh, Professor Chris Borland, who is a religion professor at that same school, uh, Father Jonathan Resmini, 
a priest at the Holy Trinity Orthodox Church in Charlotte, North Carolina. Now, Reverend Steve Lonklow, an Anglican priest working as a chaplain with the U.S. Navy. Pastor Kelly O'Sullivan, also of the Anglican tradition. Uh, Pastor Will Rose of the Holy Trinity Lutheran Church in Chapel Hill, North Carolina. Pastor Gary Atkins of Harvest Ministries Church of God of Prophecy, a uh, Pentecostal tradition. In Rock Hill, SC, Reverend Kino Reverend Kino Kennedy of Union Bethel AME Zion Church in Cornelius, NC, and Dr. Russell Moore, Director of Christianity Today's Public Theology Project, uh, representing a more Reformed Baptist tradition. And so here those are. First up, we asked Reverend Steve Lonklow of the Anglican tradition about the threefold ministry that his tradition upholds. Reverend Steve Lonklow, um, you talk about a threefold office ministry with the Anglican Church. Could you explain that for us? Yeah. So with uh, the Anglicanism and uh, it's uh, the same way with the historic churches of Roman Catholicism and the Eastern Orthodox Church, we hold to a threefold office of ministry of bishops, priests and deacons. You can think about that as like three different ranks of ministry. So when a person is initially ordained, they are not ordained to the office of like pastor or the office of an evangelist or something. We, we, in our tradition, the Anglican tradition, those are functions of a deacon or functions of a priest or functions of a bishop. So uh, when a person is first ordained, they are ordained, they are ordained to the diaconate. They're made a deacon. And, and we have permanent deacons. That, that is people who will remain deacons uh, for the rest of their life. We also have a transitional diaconate. And those are people who will eventually uh, be ordained as priests as well. So I actually served as a deacon for a few years before I was priested, um, uh, before I was ordained a priest. And uh, and that that is what I am now. I, I serve as a priest in the Anglican Church in North America, uh, serving as a chaplain in the United States uh, Navy. Next, we ask Dr. Russell Moore of the Baptist tradition and of Christianity Today, how he would define the office of the deacon. Well, I think that a, a deacon is a, a servant of the church, but uh, I think sometimes when people say servant, they, they really don't understand what that means. Um, that there is a I think that at least in some sectors of the church, there's been an overreaction to um, what we may have seen in the last generation of sorts of boards of deacons that are running churches like a corporate board that that still happens in some places. I think there's such a fear of that that in some places there's been a diminishing uh, of the office of deacon. When you look at uh, how, why deacons were, um, were called out initially in Acts 6, that is in terms of serving uh, the, the Greek widows, equipping the church to serve the Greek widows, but that, that also is administrative leadership as a part of that serving. There, there has to be the organizing of the body to do that. And so I, I've just noticed over the past several years places that are really reluctant to emphasize uh, deacons. I, I even know some churches that don't even have deacons at all, and they do that intentionally. Um, and I think that's a tragedy. And then in other places where people are kind of confused about what what deacons are to be, sometimes including the deacons themselves. Again, that was Dr. Russell Moore of Christianity Today. This next clip is from Pastor Gary Atkins of Harvest Ministries Church of God of Prophecy, a Pentecostal tradition. We ask him the same question. How do you define a deacon? A deacon is basically just a servant. Um, we all know the scripture in Acts chapter 6, the problem the church was having with the widows that weren't being taken care of. And the, th those that were dealing in the word and in prayer were getting pulled away from that main task, having to do these other tasks. Now, everything's important. Uh, 
and but that's one of our problems, I think, is we don't see that God's God's got a way to handle all these things the right way. The pastors couldn't be a couldn't afford to be pulled away to take care of the needs of these widows because then they would have left off the main thing for them in their gifted area, which was the word of God and prayer. And so the deacons were established so that they could go and do these things that the pastors and elders, so they could do what they were responsible for. To me, they're servants, Josh. A good deacon serves his church. He keeps his pastor free to do what only the pastor can do, uh, which is the word and prayer. He takes care of things that are business-related in the church, servant-related in the church, and keeps that away from the desk of the pastor, frees him up to do his job, to walk in his gifting. Uh, the, The deacon has to be spiritual. There are qualifications for that. The deacon needs to know the doctrine. That's very important. But the deacon has a different role than the pastor. He's not a, he's not a preacher. He's not that's not his role. His role is to take care of things to let the preacher fulfill his role. Again, that was Pastor Gary Atkins of Harvest Ministries Church of God of Prophecy, a Pentecostal tradition. This next clip is once again with Reverend Steve Lonklow of the Anglican tradition where he, we ask him what it means to be a deacon. Uh, traditionally, uh, any, any lay person can baptize. Um, it's, uh, for, hmm. for, good, for good order uh, and proprietary reasons, we usually reserve that to uh, priests and, and bishops uh, in, in the context of, of a church. However, if, for example, if a person is like in the hospital and they're on their deathbed and they've not been baptized, then anyone can can apply the baptism. I, I, <laughs> let me let me back that up a little bit. Huh. Any Christian can can uh, provide the baptism. So that that would include <laughs> okay. a lay person yeah. as well. So uh, um, and uh, so there's there's a lot of hospital chaplains that do that who are actually deacons, ordained Anglican deacons, but serve as hospital chaplains. So uh, deacons can perform baptisms. However, uh, when it comes to consecrating the elements for Holy Communion, that is reserved for priests and bishops. So deacons cannot okay, so consecrate communion, but they can bring communion to people. Okay, so like in the example you were talking about, a priest or a bishop would um, bless it, and then they would a deacon could bring the communion to the people in the hospital afterwards. Yes. Okay. Awesome. Um, in fact, when, when I was first ordained a deacon, I served as a pastor, though I wasn't a priest yet. I was a deacon, but it was a, I was pastor of a very small mission church. And my bishop would consecrate uh, Holy Communion for like for like th- the Sundays of that month. He, he would consecrate from a, a large reserve and then we, would, we would set aside those consecrated elements. And then every Sunday I would pull some out and then I would serve that as part of the 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 liturgy on Sunday morning. Interesting, interesting. Mm-hmm. So you don't have to be a priest to be a pastor in your tradition. You do not. It, that, that's how it, it's usually priests who are pastors. Uh, so, but but okay. it can be deacons. So when I was a deacon serving that church, I was the pastor. Again, that was Reverend Steve Lonklow of the Anglican tradition. Next up, this clip is from Pastor Gary Atkins of Harvest Ministries, Church of God of Prophecy. This time, we ask him why there's such a difference in how people view the office of the deacon. Here's what he had to say. This is the one office that we have found with the greatest diversity in what it means Mm -hmm. to these different people. Um, We have had organizations where a deacon can be a pastor because a deacon's an office. We've had a few that said a deacon is almost like your your test area before you're a pastor. You have to be a deacon long enough, and then yeah. you're allowed to be a pastor. I can see where it may be Philip. Yeah. Um, <laughs> why is there such a diff- like? Yeah. Why is there such a diversity of how we define this one? Well, you know, it is unique because, you know, you see the same laundry list of qualifications very similar to the bishop or what we call an elder, and so uh, our pastor. So, yeah, you, there is this thing where you say, what's this about? He's got these same stringent qualifications on him to hold this office. 
But if you look at Acts 6, it seems to be his role. And you look at even the definition of the word, it's the role of a servant. It's the role of taking things off the plate of those that are dealing with the word in prayer. And so me personally, I've never seen uh, where it would be anything different. Now, here's, here's what I believe. Let's say a church loses their pastor, okay? He moves away, or let's say even there's a terrible situation comes up and he fails spiritually. He has to be removed from that church. Could a deacon step in and fulfill the role? Could God even call that deacon to a different role and say, I'm going to move you up. I need you now to be a shepherd. I believe that with all my heart. I believe he could take an evangelist and lay on him later the role of a pastor, the gifting of a pastor. So I believe that could change. Yeah, uh, Time and season, right? Yes, time and season. Again, that was Pastor Gary Atkins of Harvest Ministries, Church of God of Prophecy, a Pentecostal tradition. We also asked Reverend Kelly O'Sullivan how he would define a deacon. Kelly is also from the Anglican tradition. Pastor O'Sullivan, Pastor Kelly, uh, how would you define a deacon? So, um... In the Anglican tradition, which is historic uh, Christian tradition, um, a deacon is an ordained um, minister uh, in many se- sense, uh, specifically has a uh, focus on serving. Um, and uh, in many respects, the deacon is kind of a Christian par excellence. That's the idea, is that uh, the deacon does what, uh, uh, within the, the service of the church, the deacon does what many of the lay people do. The deacon represents the lay people, leading the prayers of the people, um, representing the, uh, the people, um, at the Lord's table and, um, and also represents the church to the world, it represents Christians to the world. Um, so uh, the deacon's function within historic Christianity is to, uh, to serve, um, that's what the word deacon actually means is serving, um, to, uh, catechize, to evangelize, to help those who are widows and orphans, um, and, uh, to do all of these different things. Uh, and the deacon within the, the Anglican church in particular, uh, everyone has to be a deacon in order to become ordained as, uh, say a priest or a bishop. And the reason um, that is the case, and that would be called a transitional deacon, um, is that um, uh, if someone doesn't want to serve, then that that would be a a big red flag. Um, Everyone's called to serve and to um, to serve well. And so in many ways, uh, you know, a, a priest doesn't stop being a deacon once they're ordained a priest and neither does a bishop. They're still called to serve. Um, and so a deacon is kind of a servant par excellence. Uh, that's kind of my short answer for that. All right. Once more, that was Kelly O'Sullivan of the Anglican tradition. Next up, we asked Sister Rose of Catholic Campus Ministries at UNCW what her view is of the role of the deacon in the Catholic Church. Sister Rose, how would you define what a deacon is? A deacon? Well, now we have two kinds of deacons. We have transitional deacons and permanent deacons. So a transitional deacon is a man who is studying to become a priest. And as part of his formation, he goes through a process where he is ordained as a transitional deacon. And And then we have men who can be married or not, who are go through a formation who are ordained permanent deacons. So what the deacon does, it deacon shares in Christ's mission and grace in a very special way. Their main thing is to um, serve at the altar to assist the bishop or the priest um, with the sacraments. So, for example, with communion, um, they can preach. They can preside at weddings. They can uh, preside at funerals. And they, given, you know, the actual root meaning of the word deacon, they also give their lives in service, some particular service. Again, 
That was Sister Rose, a nun of the Catholic Church. This next clip is from an interview we did with Father Jonathan of Holy Trinity Orthodox Church in Charlotte, North Carolina. We asked him the same question. How does the Orthodox Church define what a deacon is? So we have a tradition of deacons going back to the early church. I mean, the deacons that were established uh, in the book of Acts to help the apostles, help the serve, distribute to the, those in need. Uh, there was a conflict that arose, as we know in scripture, uh, where the the widows and those in need uh, from among the Gentile Christians were being neglected. And because the apostles were busy preaching and teaching and doing all of that, uh, they appointed deacons uh, to serve um, in that diaconal ministry, that service-oriented ministry. And then over the years, it, uh, it developed into a, a more um, concrete practice, uh, 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 functional order of clergy. Um, and so that's really where I find uh, the diaconal ministry existing, um, kind of liturgically speaking. Uh, and then we also, I think, uh, diakonia, the Greek word for deacon, or where we get deacon, uh, or service, is also kind of open to anyone. So there's, I would say that there's this diaconal ministry uh, of the deacon, and historically there was also a deaconess uh, of the female diaconate. Uh, which had its own purposes liturgically, um, but, but that that kind of fell out of use over the years. And then there's this this idea of di diaconal service or um, that, that is open to everyone, um, service to the church and ministry and and care for the poor and stuff like that. So the word diaconia is used to describe uh, service uh, and also the 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 role that the the deacon liturgically. So uh, a deacon, uh, as we see in scripture, is described as, you know, in a very particular way, a person married once, someone uh, who's got a good reputation. Um, and, and that's kind of the, the, the foundational thing. And then uh, this is uh, for us, it's, a, it's an order of the clergy. There's major orders of clergy and minor orders of clergy. And the major orders of clergy are three. And the diaconal, uh, uh, the deacon is the first in that order. And their job is to serve primarily the bishop. Uh, who is the, the heir of the apostle in the particular city. Uh, and then functionally, they'll help distribute communion, uh, visit the sick, um, uh, conduct portions of the services liturgically, uh, but they can never serve a, a service on their own. Uh, that's where we differ a little bit from the, the Catholic tradition and, and, other, and other Christian traditions is our deacons can never functionally serve a service by themselves. They can only serve with either a bishop or a priest. Okay, so in your tradition, um, a deacon isn't ordained for the sacrament of word that he doesn't preach or... I mean, a deacon with the blessing to preach. I mean, anyone with a, bl a blessing to preach from the bishop uh, is able to preach. Uh, I preached before I was ordained. I preached when I was a deacon. Uh, I'm now a priest and, and I, I can, you know, I can preach as well. Uh, but I, I preach only by the blessing of the bishop, even as a priest. Uh, in, like, for instance, in Greece, uh, you have to have a theological degree uh, in order to preach. So there are priests and deacons and um, <clears throat> that are only functionally serving, uh, like, like liturgically, they're just conducting the service or celebrating the services, but because they don't have the blessing to preach, they, that's not part of their ministry. Um, hmm. All of uh, preaching, uh, because we're preaching on behalf of the bishop, uh, um, and then we, uh, under his uh, authority, uh, he gives uh, us the blessing to preach. So a deacon, again, at our church, we have a deacon and three priests, and all of us have the blessing to preach. So we all will participate in the, in the preaching ministry of the church. So, Father Jonathan, would you, did you say um, females can or th can they not serve as a deacon in the so, Orthodox so Church? In the Present practice, we do not have a female diaconate. Um, uh, historically, we did in the Orthodox Church. It, the, it fell out of practice um, a while ago. There have been instances in the last hundred years where deaconesses were ordained, um, but uh, so it's a 
it's interesting because in Greek, the word for deacon and deaconess is the same word. It's just the, the article is different. And so the ordination was actually the same prayer. Um, it would just be, so the, the direct article, um, I mean, the, the, yeah, so like it would either be o diakonos or e diakonos in Greek, which is like the male deacon or the female deacon. Huh. Uh, okay. And they served a very particular role. They participated in or, or conducted the baptisms of female people um, and visited uh, those who were, were female kind of uh, for, to preserve modesty historically. Uh, they didn't function liturgically like the male deacons did, where they would read petitions or things like that. Uh, but we did have that office, and it's not like we don't have it anymore. We just We just don't have people in that office very regularly. Um, some of the patriarchates have done it. I think they recently did it in the Alexandrian patriarchate. Um, and uh, there's a, a saint that's actually the patron saint of our sister parish here in Charlotte, St. Nectario's Church. And that saint uh, was a bishop, and it's said that he might have ordained some of the nuns at his monasteries, uh, hmm. deaconesses, um, female deacons, uh, to fill, fulfill certain roles functionally within the, within the needs of the monastery. Interesting. Uh, so it's just not, a, it's not widely practiced, but there's no reason we, theologically that we don't do it, it's just fallen out of practice over the centuries. Hmm. Okay. Again, that was Father Jonathan of the Holy Trinity Orthodox Cathedral in Charlotte, North Carolina. This next clip is from Kino Kennedy. He's a pastor at an AME Zion Church, Union Bethel in Cornelius, North Carolina. Yeah. Awesome. Okay. Reverend Kino Kennedy, how would you define a deacon? <laughs> so a deacon in our church is someone who has also the title of reverend. But again, we don't go around and say, hey, deacon, hey, deacon. No, or Deacon such and such, Deacon Jones. No, 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 no. Um, and the deacons in our church, just like the elders, are allowed to wear the clerical collars if they so choose to. Um, but I know in the United Methodist Church, if you have a stole, then you'll be wearing a deacon stole. Or even in the uh, Catholic Church, Lutheran Church, and the Anglican Church, there's a deacon stole. So there's a stole that deacon wear to distinguish them from the uh, from the elders and bishops. Um, not for us, but but again, in our church, deacons are ordained clergy and they have the title of reverend. We do not go saying deacon this, no, it's reverend. <laughs> the only difference in our church between the elder and the deacon is the elder is the only one in our church that can consecrate the elements for communion. The deacon cannot consecrate, but they can help serve. But a deacon can do everything else. They can marry, um, do baptisms and those things. So that's that's for us that what a deacon is. Again, that was Reverend Kino Kennedy of the AME Zion tradition. This next clip is from Pastor Will Rose of the Lutheran Church of America. He pastors Holy Trinity Lutheran Church in Chapel Hill, North Carolina. Pastor Will Rose, how would you define a deacon? Uh, deacon. So this is a relatively newer church office term within the Lutheran Church. I'm a part of the Evangelical Lutheran Church of America. And often when I think of deacon, I think of uh, those from the kind of Baptist persuasion. Uh, but deacons are now an ordained minister within the Lutheran Church. Now, they're not ordained into word and sacrament. They're ordained into word and service. The Greek word for deacon is diakonos, which literally means servant or helper. So those within the Lutheran church uh, have a minister role of, of word, preaching, and uh, service, serving one another and serving those in our community. And uh, within the ELCA, uh, we have um, female or women uh, deacons within our tradition. Once more, that was Pastor Will Rose of Holy Trinity Lutheran Church in Chapel Hill, North Carolina. All right. Yeah. So listening back on some of those interviews that we did and, you know, we, we did them separately, too. So I, I actually learned some stuff in the interviews I weren't present in. Um, there were a few things that stood out to me, but I wanted to see, TJ, what stood out to you most in how these guys defined the role of a deacon? Uh, I think 
you know, it's not really fair because I've heard the rest of the series already. But it was interesting <laughs> that this one was, you know, by far the most diverse. And, you know, I kind yeah. of expected it, but definitely not to this degree. Yeah, I think if I had to pick one thing that stood out the most, it was how um, Reverend Steve Lonkolo of the Anglican tradition they said that they their deacons can be pastors because pastor is in an office. It's a function. And uh, Pastor Gary Atkins, the Pentecostal church that, you know, TJ and I both grew up in, just made it very, you know, clear statement that, you know, a deacon is for service and he is not a pastor. <laughs> and it was just one of those really amusing. Wow. What a what a large difference <laughs> there. Um, also, I, I liked your interview with Kelly, he said um, something about how priests and bishops don't really stop being deacons because you have to show that you have a heart of service before you can do those things. And I thought that was a really cool clarification about why they have a transitional diaconate like that. Did anything mm -hmm. else stand out to you, TJ? Uh, not so far as the specifics of each church, uh, except I'm not sure where it is, but... Um, I think it was Dr. Moore said, you know, some deacons just mow lawns. But not sure if you guys heard that part yet, but I thought it was pretty funny. <laughs> yeah, that's actually, I think Dr. Moore said that. And coming up, they're going to hear Reverend Lonclo say something pretty much sim the same thing. Um, so where where could you see these differing ideas getting in the way of church unity, DJ? So I think uh, from a certain perspective of unity, it could be problematic. Uh, like people who think we all want to, we want to form one big church. That's not what we're doing. Uh, but if you were to do that, if you were to try to merge churches like that, the deacons might get kind of mixed up. Uh, I think it is harder than some people imply to respect deacons from other denominations. Uh but really, I think that's all kind of superficial stuff, at least from my perspective. Well, so nothing major. Yeah, yeah I, I think the biggest danger would just be some of those, the confusing thing with information, right? If you're under the impression that a deacon's only supposed to be mowing the class and doing service and you're talking to a deacon who is a pastor of the Anglican Church, you could end up coming off disrespectful because you don't know what he's doing. But I don't think it's like a clear dividing line anywhere All right so uh these next clips are from us asking them how the deacon office functions in their church here's what pastor will rose of the lutheran church of america had to say about how his church treats the office of deacon so in, in our church, we have um, Holly is our deacon of faith formation. So she's our youth director and oversees our faith formation and uh, Sunday school and really kind of the Christian education and discipleship uh, for all ages from cradle to uh, our senior citizens to those who are retired. She kind of oversees uh, the faith formation and discipleship with all those groups. Uh, so she's our deacon in 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 our particular church. So you said deacons are in your tradition ordained for, um, to give the word. Uh -huh. um, so they are, they are, um, they preach and they teach within our congregation. Not only do they serve or, you know, that you have that, um, image of Jesus wrapping a towel around his waist and washing feet as serving one another. Uh, so they, they do service ministry out in the community in their congregation, but they also uh, are oversee word, which is, would be um, yeah, preaching on, on a particular Sunday and then teaching as well. And what circumstances would they be teaching instead of the pastor? Uh, so she oversees our confirmation ministry with our teenagers. So within the Lutheran church, we baptize infants, but then when they get to be teenagers, we have this confirmation pro uh, process where they learn the catechism and scripture. And we then say, all right, it's time for you to make a public profession of your faith. And so they get up in front of the church and they confirm their baptism or affirm their baptism. And so within that confirmation class on a Sunday morning or a Wednesday evening, um, 
Holly and we have lay leaders that do this as well. Uh, but but Holly will teach a Sunday school class or uh, do a book study or teach the catechism to our teenagers. Again, that was Pastor Will Rose of Holy Trinity Lutheran Church in Chapel Hill, North Carolina. Next, we ask Professor Chris Moreland, who is a world religion professor at the University of North Carolina at Wilmington and also a member of the Catholic Church, how he would define the role of a deacon. But in both the Eastern Orthodox Church and the Catholic Church, we have permanent deacons. Permanent deacons are those that are not going to progress to priesthood. It's sort of the equivalent of a terminal MA. You know, right. you're not going to get the PhD. You're going to just get the MA. Um, and these deacons are often married. They're allowed to be married. They're allowed to have kids. Um, and their ministry is really one of service to the people of God. They do have liturgical functions. They are allowed to celebrate some sacraments, but not all. And they have some roles to play at Mass. Again, that was Professor Chris Moreland, a world religion professor and a member of the Catholic Church. Now we ask Dr. Russell Moore of Christianity Today how he thinks the office of deacon should function. Well, I've I've seen um, I've seen different ways that different churches uh, do this. In in some, um, it it really depends on the ecclesial structure of the of the church because it'd be a, a deacon in an Anglican context is a very different. Um, a, a very different sort of set of emphases than than a deacon in, say, a, a Baptist or, or, or Methodist uh, context, and so I think there are some differences depending on uh, on on the way that a church is organized and governed. And then beyond that, I've seen deacons who have functioned in terms of um, keeping track of uh, the people in the congregation who are in need. Uh, they're the ones who are doing that. Uh, other places where the, there are some churches that have unique, um, unique uh, ministries that are unique to their context. Um, so maybe a congregation that has um, has a large population of, say, Kurdish refugees nearby needing uh, ministry or a, a congregation where where many people in the church have been equipped to be engaged with foster care. I mean, uh, prison ministries, uh, all of those sorts of things. I think that um, I think sometimes you will have churches that are especially gifted in one area or the other. And. When at their best, I think deacons are an integral part of leading those things. Again, that was Dr. Russell Moore of Christianity Today. So, Josh, would you mind summarizing uh, kind of what that was like? Yeah, so in those clips we just heard, I thought it was interesting just practically what the deacon does as far as supporting pastors, as far as doing the work of ministry, as far as how they give the sacraments. Um, did you want to say anything about, like, did you learn anything specific about the deacon's role in providing sacraments in some of these denominations? Yeah, it's, uh, so we don't really come from a sacramental church. And when I say that, I mean, you know, there's not heavy emphasis placed on them as sacraments. You know, of course, we yeah. observe them and respect them, uh, but we only do four of them. Four? Ugh. Something. Four-ish. Yeah. And, uh, and that's just something that never occurred to me. Like, uh, oh, no, they're not allowed to do it. They're just deacons. Or they're only allowed to do that, actually. Yeah. I Actually, I'm not even sure, even having done these interviews, if – a deacon could baptize or give the Lord's Supper. I assume they can in our church. I don't think there's actually any like firm rules on that. But yeah. again, we just don't really put that emphasis on the sacraments. So I thought that was interesting too. Right. 
So uh, seeing how these different churches view the office of the diaconate differently, uh, what can we say about the office that's true across the board? I think one thing would just be that it is about service, right? It's about serving the community, serving others. And yeah, just that. (laughs) Um, So TJ, what would be some clues that someone might be gifted for or called to being a deacon as in like, holding that office of service or the leader of the servants. Um, Yeah. What would be some clues that someone might be called to that kind of ministry? Right. I I think if you feel at home when serving others, if that's where you're comfortable, if you just can't wait to get to the church and, you know, carry the offering plates and all that stuff, or you just really want to help the church itself, but you don't feel called to preach. I think uh, deaconhood would be perfect for you in most churches yeah and also of course if you're trying to do ministry at all in some traditions you're gonna have to be a deacon at some point right Uh, so how can this office specifically function to help better maintain church unity i imagine um since they are the leaders of the service serving you know from the church uh, deacons could reach out to other churches of other denominations to see, Hey, can we do this food bank together? Can we serve this homeless community, whatever? Um, And since they are representing the lay people, I think anyone listening, whether you're a deacon or not, well, if you're not a deacon, you could go to your deacon and say, Hey, I would like to do this kind of service. And they could reach out to other churches, put something together where we're helping the community together. And I think that is one of the most beautiful examples of unity that I know about. Anyway, so here are what some of our guests had to say about how they could relate to deacons of other traditions. Finally, we asked our guests how they can relate to deacons from other church traditions. This is what Kino Kennedy of the AME Zion Church had to say. So last question. Uh, Can you respect the authority of a deacon from another denomination? And would you expect people from other denominations to respect the authority of deacons from your church? Yes. Um, But funny enough, like I said before, we don't go around in our church saying deacon is deacon is is, is reverend. So so you wouldn't know. You wouldn't know if someone is an elder or deacon in our church unless you're paying attention to how they serve communion or what their title is. Not with saying that title, um, but that's that is the only thing you would never know unless unless um, if they are serving uh, consecrating the elements for communion. But outside of that, it's just, it's just reverend. They wear clerical collars if they so choose to. Um, they can have robes on if they so desire. Um, so yeah. Again, that was Reverend Kino Kennedy, pastor of Union Bethel AME Zion Church in Cornelius, North Carolina. This next clip is from Pastor Gary Atkins of Harvest Ministries Church of God of Prophecy, a Pentecostal tradition, on what he thinks how he could relate to deacons of other traditions. Um, If a deacon from another denomination reached out to you to do a service together with their church, whether it be a food bank or, you know, helping at a homeless shelter, doing donations, whatever, what would be the criteria for you to be willing to work with their church and that deacon? Yeah, it would just go back to everything we've said before, and I know this is a separate segment, but it would just be orthodox beliefs and teachings. Um, you know, if, if we're going to partner with you, the Bible says, how can you have fellowship if you're, or how can you have agreement if, it doesn't say that at all. It says, uh, how can two walk together unless there's agreement? I can't, I can't walk with you, I don't care what the task is, if we don't agree with each other on certain basic orthodox principles and beliefs of Scripture. So, Josh, it would just always boil down to what do you say about Jesus, what do you say about His Word, back to what you mentioned earlier, do you believe in these fundamental things of the faith? Um, I'm going to do something weird enough that I know it's not any one specific belief. Yeah. If let's say a deacon from a church, you know, checked off the salvation stuff, right? They, yeah. they believe faith in Christ alone is how you get saved. They believe the triune God, mm-hmm. the Nicene Creed. Yeah. 
But for some reason, they believe that James, brother of Jesus, since he was the brother of Jesus, had supernatural godlike powers, could fly and shoot lasers out of his eyes. Yeah, yeah. Is that, I mean, especially since they're saying, you know, he had a supernatural power, would that be a line of, that's just too weird for us to work with you, Bob? Oh, well, well, anything that would be extra biblical, okay? Or uh, outside of scripture, there's nothing in the Bible that says James had supernatural powers. And I know it's just a, analogy you're giving or a thought there's nothing in the bible that supports that so i couldn't have any agreement with that now listen to me if you're going to believe that which the word would not support then you might believe anything that the word might wouldn't support you understand what i'm saying so yeah that those things would just naturally just we can't we can't work together i can't i can't join hands with you because we're not in agreement so even if the bible doesn't directly say james did not have superpowers no, no. it's because you're getting into that extra biblical territory is where well, you draw just, the line when you say supernatural powers i'd have to define that you know what are we talking about <laughs> if you say he flew around and such as that well yeah that's you, you that's some issues you know because that's now nowhere in scripture anybody's yeah. flying around you understand what i mean yeah and so yeah there are certain things that would just take you out of that realm of orthodox um solid solid ground in in scripture and yeah and and like if someone did say that josh anything like that it would be obvious it'd be like a big old you know yes. finger sticking out their forehead you'd see it a mile away if, if that was the kind of who they were again that was pastor gary atkins of harvest ministries church of god of prophecy a pentecostal tradition this next clip is what Reverend Steve Lonklo had to say about how he could relate to deacons from other traditions. Could you respect the authority of a deacon from another denomination? And would you expect people from other denominations to respect the deacons of your church? That's a great question, because I, I think when when it comes to what deacons do, so many different churches have different understandings of what their diaconate does. So I uh, let me give you an example. I have a, a good friend of mine uh, that we, we came up together. He goes to a Baptist ish church. It's actually a Bible church, uh, non-denominational congregational Bible church. He was asked to be a deacon at his church. And in his mind, he got really excited because he thought he was going to be doing like the next level of ministry than what he was already doing as a lay person. As it turned out, and he, he's telling me this, uh, he, he was basically made a glorified groundskeeper. So he was, uh, he had the keys, yeah. he could unlock the church, lock the church after services. He made sure that the lawn got mowed and that the, uh, that the bills got paid. Um, and so in his mind, he was thinking, gosh, I'm not even doing ministry, though I've been sort of put in this ministerial role. So it was, it was very ambiguous as to exactly what deacons were in his church. So I, I would say, like, for someone in that context, can I respect a deacon? Uh, yeah, yeah, sure. You know, uh, d depending on what it is per from church to church. Right. Um, and in my church, deacons have a, a more clearly defined role of actual doing ministry, teaching, serving, visiting people in their homes, bringing Christ to the people. Um, so it, uh, it yeah. really depends on, on what the different churches do and how they think about their own diaconate, I, I would say, as, as how I would relate yeah. to, to them. Okay. So you said that the Catholic Church and the Anglican Church um, sort of have the same function for deacons or close to it. Um, would you, I don't know, would you be okay with listening to a Catholic deacon teach or would you be okay with a deacon from your tradition teaching in a Catholic situation? I, you know, I can't think of why that would happen, but yeah, yeah, certainly, certainly. So when, when, when you look at the, the three historic churches for, for, for lack of, of, of a better word, the, the, the three churches that have maintained apostolic succession, which I'm sure we'll talk about that phrase in a few moments, uh, which is the, the Catholic, <laughs> yeah. the Orthodox, the Anglican. We, we are, all, all three of our offices of bishop, priest, and deacon are very similar to each other. So yeah, a Catholic deacon, an Anglican deacon, an Orthodox deacon would be doing the same kind of ministry in their context. So yeah, I, I'd be happy to to work alongside a Catholic deacon, an Orthodox deacon, um, as far as doing that diaconal ministry. 
but th- that doesn't exclude uh, other traditions yeah. as well. You know, and 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 some some churches like like yeah. uh, Presbyterian churches I've I've worked with, and Lutheran churches. I have friends who are Lutheran pastors. You know, their their deacons are actually doing ministry work. You know, it's just yeah. s- some churches the de- their deacons aren't really ministers so much as they're more groundskeepers. So it all depends yeah. on yeah. the job description, I guess. Again, that was Reverend Steve Lonclo of the Anglican tradition. This next clip is of Professor Chris Moreland, a world religion professor and also a member of the Catholic Church. Here's how he believes he could relate to deacons from other traditions. All right. Uh, Can you respect the authority of a deacon from another denomination? And would you expect other denominations to respect the authority of your deacons? I would say that it would. One would have to sort of parse that out a little bit in terms Mm -hmm. of courtesy and Christian charity. uh, Anyone who is a believer in Christ and who is attempting to follow the gospel Uh, If their denomination has identified them as a deacon, um, then out of professional courtesy and Christian charity, I would respect them. However, there is a higher level of respect and acknowledgement that I would give to someone who has been ordained as a deacon rather than being elected or self-appointed. So someone who has received a form of sacrament, a form of ordination, um, and we believe that those those ordinations are a sign that the Holy Spirit has called this person and has anointed this person to serve in this ministry. So I would, on a higher level, yes, I would say those that have a sacerdotal ordained diaconate, the Eastern Orthodox Church, uh, the Oriental Orthodox, and some High Church Anglicans, I would say, um, that would be in a different category. Right. Gotcha. All right. Again, that was Professor Chris Moreland of the Catholic Church. This next clip is from Pastor Will Rose of the Lutheran Church and how he thinks he could relate to deacons from other traditions. Could you respect the authority of a deacon from another church denomination? And do you expect people from other denominations to respect the authority of deacons from your church? Uh, I would hope so. I realize that there are kind of semantics that you have to kind of get down to how people define that term. So maybe in another church, a deacon is just an elected uh, leader within their congregation uh, to help and serve with their congregation. They may not be ordained to to preach and other things, but but if they want to come here, our congregation and and teach, that would be fine. And I know that there's some. Uh, church traditions, Christian traditions that do not ordain uh, women or don't have female preachers. Uh, so our deacon, Deacon Holly, uh, may not have the authority to to teach or preach in someone else's church, but I would hope that they would see her as qualified and, and educated and smart and uh, a full minister within the whole church that she would be able to, to preach and teach in their, in their congregation. If a church leader from another denomination refuse to respect or call Holly a deacon, would that be reason for you to no longer have unity with that church? Yeah, it would be tough. I think I I would never go as far as to say that they are not a Christian or they're not a Christian church. I would just disagree heartily on where God's call is is, uh, directed. Okay. Once more, That was Pastor Will Rose of Holy Trinity Lutheran Church in Chapel Hill, North Carolina. So hearing how in these clips our guests said they could relate to other deacons, uh, what do you think our actions this week should be for people to better maintain unity concerning this church office? Uh, Yeah. Uh, A, pray to see if you were called to be a deacon. B, reach out to your deacon about doing service with other churches. Right. And Just what, pretty much what, what you, we said before. What do you think would be the ramifications if we all did that? Uh, you'd see more churches serving together. More needy would get helped. Uh, what do you think, TJ? 
Uh, sounds like the diaconate would get a little uh, competitive. <laughs> Maybe. Who knows? That might be a good thing, though. <laughs> um, speaking of service, here's one last clip from Sister Rose about how this impact could be made in our communities. Yeah. Yeah. So you, would you say there's more room for unity and service rather than oh, absolutely. In liturgy, basically? Yeah. Absolutely. Okay. But I mean, service is, is the, you know, it's the heart of what we're doing, isn't it? I mean, for us, oh, yeah. you know, Eucharist is central, right? It, it's the source and summit of all that we do. But what Eucharist does, we receive Christ and then we go out into the world to be Christ with one another and for one another. Again, that was Sister Rose of the Catholic Church. No, uh, isn't that great? Uh, so for our God moment this week, um, if you haven't been with us for this before, uh, we just like to take a minute to share what all God's been doing with us. And that can be a challenge, a blessing, a moment of worship, anything along those lines. And I always make Josh go first. So, Josh, uh, do you have a God moment for us this week? Hmm. I. Okay. So over the weekend, I had one day where I had a really bad migraine, which put me behind school and schoolwork the week right before finals. And uh, one of the things I wasn't able to get to, the professor went ahead and put an extension out for everybody because people were having a hard time downloading that day. So, yeah, I thank God for that random blessing where, yeah, I didn't lose points for being sick. Yeah, praise God. Uh, My God moment, uh, I got, I think I got eight hours of sleep uh, for the past two nights. Which has been pretty awesome. Sounds pretty rare. Usually I, I wake up at 545 in the morning uh, for work. I just I've been off work and uh, I'm not going to bed at 9 p.m. Uh, to get eight hours of sleep every night. I refuse to do it. But man, it's been nice these past couple of days. Uh, so if you enjoyed this episode, please consider sharing it with a friend or an enemy. If you have any cousins Those count as both. Uh, So let them know. Uh, You guys sharing it helps a ton. Mm -hmm. And uh, we love the support. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, if you want to hear either or both of us ramble on about some geeky stuff that we like, you know, Star Wars comics, whatever, uh, be sure to head over to systematicgeekology.org. Check out our other podcast, Systematic Geekology. We just talk about how we see God in geeky things. It's a fun time. Right, and thank you for listening to the Whole Church Podcast. Uh, tune back in next week for part three of our Church Offices series, where we'll discuss the office of the pastor or the priest. Uh, following that will be the office of the bishop. And then after we complete the series, we'll take two weeks off before returning to our normal format. And at the end of season one, Francis Chan will be joining us. Yeah, he's not aware, but it'll happen. Season one does not end until Francis Chan is on the show. Indeed. Thank you again for listening to The Whole Church Podcast. Once more, you can sponsor this show at patreon.com forward slash The Whole Church Podcast for $3 a month. Thank you all for listening.